minority rule that I'm describing is a distinctly American problem. It's not unique to the US, but it's t taken on a particularly distinctive form in the United States. And no other established democracy can partisan minorities thwart electoral majorities as consistently and as consequential. Now, why is this the case? Well, excessive counter-majoritarianism used to be widespread across the world. It's not just the US. Consider for a moment the world's uh, second oldest written constitution. Just a few decades old, uh, written a few decades after America's constitution, the Norwegian constitution, written in 1814, second oldest written constitution in the world. It's, uh, con Norway's constitutional uh, framers were inspired by the American founding experience, but, and their initial creation was also not entirely revolutionary. Norway, after 1814, retained a hereditary monarch. Kings retained the power to appoint cabinets and to veto legislation. Members of parliament were indirectly elected with electoral, regional electoral colleges. And voting was limited uh, to men who met certain property requirements. Now, Norway was not unusual. In the 19th century in Europe, states had all sorts of undemocratic institutions, monarchical vetoes, indirect elections, aristocratic upper chambers, unelected uh, or badly malapportioned legislative chambers, filibuster-like mechanisms that blocked uh, majorities in, in parliaments. But over time, other established democracies gradually dropped these pre-democratic institutions. So consider again Norway. So in the 19th century, Norway underwent a series of far-reaching democratic reforms, all under the auspices of its still existing constitution. Parliamentary sovereignty was established, 1905, a constitutional reform eliminated these regional electoral colleges and established direct elections for parliament. Property restrictions were limited, eliminated, and universal male and female suffrage was established in 1913. Now, this kind of reform actually wasn't so unusual. Consider Britain began, also began the 20th century by weakening the House of Lords of its veto power. Like Norway, Denmark, Sweden, New Zealand, and Portugal ultimately got rid of their upper chambers altogether. Germany, Austria, and Belgium, as federal countries, democratized their upper chambers by making them more proportional to population. Britain, Canada, Australia, France, and other democracies established cloture rules, which allowed simple legislative majorities to end debates within parliaments. Germany, Switzerland, and France imposed term limits on their national courts or their Supreme Court justices. And the United Kingdom, Canada, Sweden established retirement ages for justices. And every other presidential democracy on earth, every other presidential democracy on earth got rid of its electoral college. Argentina was the last other democracy that had an electoral college for presidential elections. It eliminated it in 1994. So other democracies have become more democratic over the last century, eliminating 18th and 19th century institutions that allowed minorities to systematically thwart majorities. The US simply hasn't done this. Today, then, the US is the world's only presidential democracy with an electoral college for selecting our president. We have the most malapportioned Senate in the world except for Argentina and Brazil. No other democracy allows a congressional minority to routinely veto regular legislation that's backed by a, a majority. And the US is the only established democracy uh, with truly lifetime appointments for Supreme Court justices. Every other democracy has either term limits or a mandatory retirement age. Each of these institutions would make the US an outlier, but you add them up and the U.S. Is, a, is really a distinctive outlier. It's uniquely counter-majoritarian. And I think this in part explains why American democracy seems to be uniquely threatened among Western democracies. Now, I can't talk about American democracy without giving some reflections on what to do about this all. Um, this is what people want to know the answer to. I'm really a big believer uh, in the line from Jane Addams, the early 20th century uh, reformer, uh, who said, the cure for the ills of democracy is more democracy. Americans need to do the work of democratizing their democracy through reforms that ensure that electoral majorities can actually govern. So in our book, uh, we propose 15 different reforms. I'm not gonna go through all of them now, but the highlights include entrenching voting rights and ensuring equal access to the ballot, introducing different forms of proportional representation, replacing the electoral college with direct presidential elections, democratizing the Senate by eliminating or at least weakening the filibuster, establishing term limits for Supreme Court justices. Now, this is a long list that may seem very ambitious to some, but Americans have a long history of working to make our political system more democratic. It goes back to the founders. I would be remiss in a lecture series named after Thomas Jefferson to not quote Thomas Jefferson. So I'm gonna quote Thomas Jefferson. He was one of the founders who was especially critical of those who, quote, look at the Constitution with sanctimonious reverence 
and deem the Constitution like the Ark of the Covenant, too sacred to be touched. In Jefferson's view, constitutions need to change. Jefferson wrote, laws and institutions must go hand in hand with the progress of the human mind. We might as well require a man to wear still the suit which fitted him when a boy, if civilized people was to remain under the regimen of their barbarous ancestors. Now, Jefferson's view of the Constitution may have been on the radical edge of the founders, I and mean, he thought that there should be you know, constantly renewed constitutions, but he wasn't alone. Now, George Washington wrote a letter to his nephew in 1787 in which he described the Constitution as a, quote, imperfect document, and that it would be, quote, up to future generations to approve it, approve upon it. And generations of Americans actually have done this. The Bill of Rights, the expansion of suffrage, the Reconstruction Amendments, the progressive era reforms at the beginning of the 20th century, Americans have worked to make our democracy more democratic. But what's striking, the exception is really over the last half century, we've stopped doing that work. Since around 1970, we stopped trying to make our political system more democratic. And so one of the kind of broader points I would want to end with is to say we have to restore this country's reformist tradition and put political reform back on the public agenda. And if we don't, I think our democracy will continue to be vulnerable to the kind of crises that we've been living through over the last several years. A final word, uh, looking forward to the 2024 election and the kind of ne next year, because this agenda that I've just laid out is in some sense a long-run agenda. The kind of implications of my analysis, I think, include both some good news and some bad news. You know, in America, as in all of Western Europe, electorates are divided between a broad, co what I would call a kind of broad cosmopolitan coalition ranging from the, the left to the center right, mostly centered in cities. Uh, on the one hand, vis-a-vis, -vis, and then on the other hand, a kind of ethno-nationalist coalition that's much smaller. And there's some good news in this, because in all Western democracies, the cosmopolitan coalition is really the consistent majority. Our electorates are overwhelmingly committed to liberal values for the most part and democratic values. So that's the good news. The bad news is there's two ways in which this majority cosmopolitan coalition can get into trouble and can be thwarted. As in the US, our institutions can sometimes give the ethno-nationalist minority an artificial boost, give them outsized influence, not only in the US, but think in Hungary, Viktor Orban's majorities turn into super majorities with his electoral institutions. Think of the first past the post system in Britain, which allows the Tory party, sometimes even with around 30% of the vote, with keys to the government. So that's one problem. The institutions can thwart the majority. A second vulnerability, though, second way democracies can get into trouble, is if this cosmopolitan coalition allows itself to be fractured, even when facing serious democratic threats. So debates over immigration can do this, debates over race can do this, and as we've seen in the last month, debates over foreign policy can do this as well. So I think in the U.S. today, there's a risk that this Biden coalition could fracture over the Israel-Hamas war. So I feel some sense of foreboding about this. Now, this is a, there's a risk, you know, that his base won't, not that people will vote for Trump, but that people will vote, people will vote for third parties, and so on. And the point here is that pro-democratic coalitions have to be big, and as a result of that, they're often very diverse. And there's always the risk of fracturing. And that fracturing is in, in part what allowed Orban to get back into power in Hungary. And it's also I, how I fear Donald Trump could come back, back into power. So facing these democratic West, threats across the West, I think it's key that democratic forces, pro-democratic forces, remember the stakes of the contest. And I'm reminded here of the civil rights era song that inspired that coalition to get, stay together to democratize America. Keep your eye on the prize. Keep your eye on the prize. Democracy itself is at stake. Thank you.